What did Kennedy represent? Why is this moment so important? He's not the only great president of his era. Dwight Eisenhower was in many ways a great president. Lyndon Johnson did extraordinary things. And Kennedy was far from perfect, and his time in office was relatively short, only about a thousand days, only about a thousand days. What was it that he represented? The phrase he used that stays with us is that of a new frontier, a new frontier. Kennedy promised that American society could do better, that we could live better, that we could be more democratic, lowercase d, more prosperous, more humane, and we could do more for the world. His critique of the 1950s, of the decade between World War II and his presidency, when he was a young member of Congress and then a senator, his critique is that we were under-challenging ourselves, that we had become too comfortable, we had become too fearful, fearful of conflict, and that we had become too undisciplined. We were not focused on what really mattered. Kennedy was a critic of television, even though he used television. He believed that television distracted. He was part of a large number of Americans who feared the dumbing down of our society from television. They hadn't even seen Twitter and Facebook yet. Think of what they would have said. He believed Americans also had grown prosperous, but were too selfish, too committed to their own prosperity. He quoted Theodore Roosevelt, saying that Americans needed the strenuous life, not the self-satisfied life. It wasn't about counting your money and building bigger houses. It was about becoming a better person and leaving a better country to yourself and to others. And he believed that Americans were fearful, fearful that they had so much to lose after they had become so prosperous and won a war, so fearful they were unwilling to stand up for what they really believed in. He said when running for president in July of 1960 at his uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention, after beating out more established politicians for the Democratic nomination, he said that our nation stands on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, a frontier of unknown opportunities and paths, a frontier of unfulfilled hopes and threats. Kennedy's argument, drawing on the work of Frederick Jackson Turner and other historians who believed that the frontier experience had opened American society, the moving to the frontier, moving to new space, trying new things, that that had made us who we are, that the democracy of our society was made on the frontier. He believed Americans needed new frontiers. We needed new places to put our metal, to put our brains, to put our bodies to work. He believed we needed new goals, new aspirations. We had to hold ourselves to higher standards, he said. And there were a number of ways he immediately sought to do this. This is rhetoric, ladies and gentlemen. It's policy. It's inspiration. And it is hope, all the same. You cannot become a better society if you do not aspire to be a better society. And that's where leaders matter. The one thing history shows is that leaders set the tone. Leaders articulate values. Leaders don't make that much happen themselves, but they do inspire, and they set a tone, and they set a model. They set a model for people. Young men and women growing up at that time idealized this man. They idealized John F. Kennedy because he held them to higher hopes. He offered them something better. He began, actually, with his inaugural address, calling on people to sacrifice. Everyone remembers this line written by, the by Theodore Sorensen, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that we should pay any price, bear any burden to support the virtues and needs of our democracy. He began actually by pursuing this set of policies by articulating a goal for Americans in space, the space race. He came to Rice University in Texas and announced that NASA would set a goal of reaching space, reaching the moon by the end of the decade. We were apparently behind the Soviets, or so it seemed that way, especially after the Soviet Sputnik launch of the first uh, artificial Earth satellite in 1957. And he argued that the United States would show that it could do better. Space and reaching the moon would be a goal where we could bring together our scientific talent, bring together our physical abilities, bring together our know-how and reach a goal, a goal that would show what we could achieve and set a model for cooperation and a creation of peace he hoped in a new space, literally and figuratively. When asked why, 
He quoted uh, the great uh, British mountain climber, man who climbed Everest, Edmund Hillary. When asked why Hillary climbed the mountain, Kennedy said, he said, because it was there. Because it is there, we must try to do this. Space exploration was not profitable. It produced byproducts that were useful for American society. My, my favorite one is Tang. The drink was produced actually, uh, so that uh, astronauts could have something to drink when they were in space. Uh, but it wasn't really about economics and it wasn't really about foreign policy. It was about doing what leaders must do, which is to set a high, worthwhile, hopeful goal that would bring people together and allow them to make themselves better in the process. That's what he believed the space race was. This was combined with a set of new economic policies. Kennedy was the first Keynesian. Kennedy was the first Keynesian, the first president really, more than Roosevelt even, to embrace the idea that the federal government should be more active in stimulating and managing the economy. The conventional wisdom through Herbert Hoover's presidency was that the, the, the economy was like a clock. It had to operate on its own and politicians had to stay away from the market. Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, intervened obviously much more directly in the economy, but those were seen as emergency measures. And Roosevelt still believed that the economy should operate largely on its own. Kennedy was the first person to really buy into John Maynard Keynes's idea and to appoint Keynesians around him that the government should play a more active role regulating and managing the economy. Lest we think this is the stereotype that people often have of this, of the government over controlling the economy, that is not at all what Kennedy believed. He believed instead that spending should be about investment by the government. He was a critic, as many presidents have been, Democrat and Republican, of spending on pet projects for senators and members of Congress, for spending on pork. Instead, he wanted to spend on investment. He wanted to build on the work of Dwight Eisenhower in building our interstate highway system, which is now decrepit after years of underinvestment in the 21st century, but was the basis for creating an integrated land trucking economy in the United States. He wanted to invest in energy exploration, including in Texas, in oil exploration. He wanted to invest in science. He wanted to invest government money in things that would stimulate the economy, but would produce capital investments for long-term economic growth. Here was his argument that the government must aid those who are poor and vulnerable, that's the New Deal lesson, but it must go further. It must be investor in chief, investing in new technologies, new infrastructure, and new elements of our society that would produce long-term economic gain for more people. He actually reduced the federal tax rate to encourage individuals to invest, but then used revenue that came in to invest himself as a, the leader of the federal government for the federal government to be investing in these areas. He invested in particular in higher education. His belief was that the United States needed to produce the most educated, diverse citizenry for the challenges of our time. It's interesting, on these points, uh, Dwight Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy actually agreed in practice more than in rhetoric. It was Dwight Eisenhower who created the National Defense Education Act, which provided the basis for middle-class scholarships to go to college that they had not existed before. Uh, I am one product of those. I went to college a lot later. I come from an immigrant working class family. Uh, it was scholarships from the federal government and from the university I went to that made it possible for me to go to college. That process began with Dwight Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy. Before Kennedy's presidency, most college students were not middle class. After Kennedy's presidency, many of them would be middle class. Uh, we have challenges of college tuition and various other things in the 21st century. That's another story. Uh, but the growth of middle class higher education was a federal government investment in the late 19th century. It began then. It was amped up, built up in the 1950s and 60s and became the process what we would recognize today, what we would recognize today from the 1960s, from the period of Kennedy's presidency. 